Nice. I think it is should be fine, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so All right, so it is three o'clock. So let us start. Maybe I give a brief introduction to you. Uh, so welcome everybody to this uh, presentation. As you can see on the screen, Intelligent uh, Communication Environments for uh, 6D Wireless Systems is uh, presented by Dr. Etugar Basar. He is an Associate Professor in Cock University, Turkey, Department of Electrical Engineering electrical and electronics engineering. He has long experience in uh, uh, these new research areas, many publications to his credit. And he's a senior editor in many of the, you know, well-known IEEE uh, journals. So it is my pleasure on behalf of uh, the Center for Wireless Communication Finland to welcome him to this presentation. Uh, Dr. Basar, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nandana. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this nice organization and giving me the opportunity to interact with uh, researchers who are interested in this field. So, uh, as Professor mentioned, we will talk about intelligent communication environments with reconfigurable intelligent surfaces in today's talk. So, uh, I will start with a brief outline on beyond 5G and 6G, particularly from the physical layer perspective. Uh, that, I will introduce reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, the new frontier in wireless communication. So we, we call it wireless 2.0. I will explain in detail. So I will cover state-of-the-art advances in intelligent communication environments, and we will also discuss uh, potential applications of these intelligent surfaces towards future applications. And finally, uh, we will discuss the corrections. So uh, I, I'm planning to go these steps very quickly. So this is the famous uh, five sheet triangle that you know from the past few years. So uh, we have released 15 almost two years ago, just a couple of years ago, release 16 has been frozen uh, after a three month delay due to COVID outbreak. So we have uh, advanced physical layer solutions uh, in uh, 5G. So you all know for the first time we moved above 60 gigahertz. We have uh, massive MIMO, we have multiple OFDM numerologists, but we have seen something during the standardization of this technology. So uh, there is no single enabling technology in the physical layer which can be used to support all these different diverse applications. So it has been seen by both academia and industry very clearly in the past couple of years. And we have seen that we need more flexible, more uh, spectrum and energy efficient physical layer techniques for particularly beyond 5G. So that's the reason why we started active research. Uh, also several other groups worldwide started active research on 6G. So uh, th this is a very nice figure from uh, the paper of colleagues. Uh, also Professor Benis, maybe he might be here. I couldn't check. So I, I took his permission earlier to use this figure from his paper. So uh, we will have driving applications like multi-sensory augmented reality, virtual reality applications, connected robot robotics, wireless brain computer interaction, and so on. So we will see, this is the, our expectations. Uh, what will be the driving trends? Of course, we will need more bits, more spectrum, more reliability. We will need new definitions for spectral efficiency. And today's talk particularly focuses on emergence of smart surface and environments. There are some other driving trends like, I mean, uh, self-sustaining networks, et cetera. So massive, massive availability of data as well. So we will have enabling technologies. Again, uh, there are very exciting technologies with us uh, in the context of 6G wireless networks, terahertz uh, networks, uh, I mean transceivers with integrated bands, and communications with intelligence services. This, this is the topic of today's talk. Edge artificial intelligence, long terrestrial networks, energy harvesting, and so on. So these will be the enabling technologies. So uh, in today's talk, I will particularly focus on uh, intelligence services and how we can use them for future wireless networks. So maybe you may have seen Samsung released uh, a 6G white paper just a couple of weeks ago. It was July 14th. So according to Samsung, uh, there will be 3K applications in 6G. What are these? Truly immersive augmented reality, virtual reality, high fidelity mobile hologram and digital replica. So th these are the envision of uh, Samsung. 
And uh, what Samsung predicts that in order to enable these technologies, why we cannot enable these technologies as of tomorrow? Because we don't have that uh, wireless uh, communication, physical layer, particular technologies as of today. So Samsung predicts that we might need a 50-fold increase from 20 gigabits to 1,000 gigabits in peak data rate. And in terms of user experience data rate, in order to support these uh, applications, we might need a 10-fold increase compared to 5 from 0 0.1 gigabits per second to 1 gigabits per second. So as you see, uh, these are the other key performance indicators such as reliability, latency, density, spectral efficiency. So we expect huge improvements by 6G. So this is the vision of uh, Samsung. So you may ask this question. So why we can't have this uh, very exciting applications as of tomorrow. So we cannot have those uh, truly immersive uh, augmented reality, digital replica and so on, because our technology is not mature and strong enough. So there are some factors which are slowing us down uh, since the early ages. Actually, these are the main problems of wireless communications. So what are these? We have deep fading there, severe attenuation, block line of sight, we have severe interference, we have Doppler effects due to high mobility, we have eavesdropping due to the wireless, I mean, inherently uh, open nature of the wireless propagation. And we have this random channel. Uh, th th this is there since 80s, since the modern age of uh, wireless communications. And we might say that the existing uh, modern physical layer solutions are not strong enough. So th this is a maybe ambitious and strong claim, but this is correct. And the overall progress is relatively slow. So if we can take a look into 5G physical layer, I have to admit that it is not a revolution. It is an evolution. So uh, we made significant improvements in the physical layer, but those were not radical improvements, I have to say. So we have very sophisticated solutions like adaptive modulation and coding, multi modulation, NOMA, relaying, dynamic spect spectrum allocation, reconfigurable and et cetera. But unfortunately, these are not enough. And we need new and radical solutions in the physical layer uh, to enable uh, truly pervasive wireless networks towards 6 g wireless networks. And in the past couple of years, uh, in the context of these radical physical layer solutions, uh, there has been a great interest communication paradigms in which we exploit the randomness of the channel, randomness of the propagation environment. So we can exploit this randomness in order to simplify the transmitter or receiver architecture or <coughs> use it in order to increase the quality of service, in order to increase the spectral efficiency, energy efficiency. So I will give two main examples on this interesting concept. The first one is index modulation technologies in which we use the of the entities at the transmitter side, actually we all use the inherent randomness of the propagation environments by index modulation. The second thing is one step beyond index modulation, smart radio environments with reconfigurable intelligent uh, surfaces. Actually, index modulation uh, is a very promising, promising uh, physical architecture. I made several presentations in the past couple of years uh, we also published several papers in magazines, tutorials, etc. in this area in the past couple of years. Th this is different than what we know in digital communications in the past 60 years. So uh, since the Shannon age, we are transmitting information by, uh, I mean, modulating the amplitude phase or frequency of a high frequency carrier signal. So X modulation challenges this stat statu quo. So we the indices of the building blocks of corresponding communication systems. So what are those building blocks? For instance, if you have a <coughs> system, you can exploit the transmit antennas, the indices of transmit antennas. If you have subcarriers um, or FTM system, you can exploit the indices of subcarriers. For a reconfigurable antenna, you can exploit the indices of antenna patterns, and so on. So time slots, transmit LEDs for a visible light communication system. You can use indices of relays, modulation types, spreading costs, dispersion maps, and so on. So it adds you an additional degree of freedom to convey information. And because of this additional degree of freedom, index modulation techniques uh, consider innovative ways, so as we discussed earlier, and because of these innovative ways, they offer attractive advantages in terms of spectrum efficiency, energy efficiency, and hardware, uh, simplicity. So uh, three most popular forms of index modulation are spatial modulation, 
OFDM with index modulation, media-based modulation. So I will briefly discuss this. So spatial modulation appears as a third MIMO mode. I'm, maybe you, may, you might have heard spatial modulation. So right now, for instance, your mobile phone selects one of these two modes. If you are connected into a Wi-Fi network or a 4G network, spatial multiplexing can transmit diversity. Spatial appears as a third MIMO mode here, according to incoming bits, you activate one of the transmit antennas, so this is determined by incoming bits, then you uh, send the ordinary data symbol from the activated antenna. So what is the advantage? You have a single radio frequency chain compared to uh, ordinary MIMO transmission concepts. There are many other advanced forms of spatial modulation. So as far as I know, the original paper from Mesle, uh, who is a close colleague of mine, so this is maybe around 2,000 citations. So uh, these became highly popular uh, modulation concept, and hopefully it might have a, a chance for future wireless networks towards 6G. So uh, OFDM with index modulation uh, is a waveform uh, that we developed during my PhD years. So uh, I mean, the same concept, we are indexing, but right now the indexing is done in uh, OFDM domains, sub-blocks domain. But uh, since, you know, in the practical systems, we, we have a high number of sub let's say uh, 500 or 1,000 sub in a practical system, if we are following a divide and conquer approach, so we are dividing the whole OFDM block into smaller sub-blocks, and similar to spatial modulation, uh, with a group of incoming bits, we activate some of the sub -carriers. Then uh, from those active sub -carriers, uh, we transmit ordinary uh, data symbols. So, uh, I mean, uh, for instance, there's an example here from this table. Incoming two bits, uh, in this case, I divide the whole sub block uh, into whole block into sub blocks with four sub carriers. And according to the incoming two bits, I activate uh, first two or uh, second and third, third and fourth and first and fourth sub carriers, for instance. I'm doing it according to the information bits. So I have to admit that uh, this initial design, the next modulation, uh, it created a new line of research in waveform design approaching almost 600 citations. And the good news is uh, 5G selected OFDM. Uh, therefore, you can use OFDM with index modulation with a simple modification set to transmitter and receiver side. You don't need additional hardware. You don't need additional filters, etc. as well in other non-orthogonal waveforms. So it is a much simpler, uh, uh, I mean, a modification compared to OFDM, and it provides provides uh, significant uh, advantages compared to ordinary OFDM. So the third one is media-based modulation. Actually, this is also very closely related by intelligent surfaces that we will cover in the upcoming slides I'm coming there. So in media-based modulation, I have a reconfigurable antenna. So what is a reconfigurable antenna? Reconfigurable antenna contains some kind of a uh, radio frequency mirrors, parasitic devices, for instance, pin diodes, and you are adjusting the own status of those pin diodes, and you are creating a different radiation pattern. So in a rich scattering environment, when you have different radiation patterns, uh, the transmitted signals, uh, I mean, interact with different objects and you can create a different signature at the receiver side. And media-based modulation uses this concept. According to the information bits, you are selecting one of the radiation patterns and your receiver is trying to find which radiation pattern is selected. So again, we have a single radio frequency chain, but we are creating some kind of a virtual MIMO system by this uh, antenna patterns, multiple antenna patterns. It is also a very promising direction, in my opinion, still unexplored. Uh, it is not as uh, popular right now as uh, intelligent surfaces, but exactly the same concept. This is an intelligent antenna, uh, some sort of. So uh, what about intelligent radio environments, intelligent surfaces? Those index modulation techniques we discussed in the previous three, four slides, we were playing at the transmitter side. But intelligent radio environments with intelligent surfaces, we, we are right now playing with the environment itself. So the, the, this is the reason why it's a paradigm shift in wireless communications. Because the propagation medium, as you all know, 
it's a randomly behaving entity between the transmit and receiver. Why it is random? Because the transmitted signals, uh, scatters, uh, reflex, diffraction occurs, shadowing occurs, and this is the famous curve from uh, Andre Gossin's Rapoport's book. So we have, I mean, path loss on top of it. We have shadowing effect and multi-path effect. So this is random and unpredictable behavior. And since the early ages, always as communication engineers, we assume that so this is the channel between transmitter and receiver. This is random, degrades my signal quality, and I need to do some tricks at the transmitter side and receiver side in order to compensate the negative effect of the channel. So this intelligent radio environments is a, a different concept because we are trying to play with the channel itself. So that's the reason why we call it wireless 2.0. So this is possible by reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So these are reconfigurable, man-made two-dimensional surfaces they are intelligent because we are controlling them with integrated electronics and they are reconfigurable because they provide unique wireless communication capabilities that i can tune so it provides a new way uh, to operators to customize the propagation environment in order to increase the quality of service and more importantly uh, we are trying to do this without increasing the power consumption. So we are just recycling, re-engineering the existing electromagnetic base. So that's the reason why uh, we envision that it can be a wireless 2.0 solution. Uh, there are many open problems we will discuss, hopefully in the following one hour I'm planning to finish. It's a long presentation, but uh, hopefully uh, we will cover uh, many open problems, also many exciting applications of uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So what is a re reconfigurable intelligent surface? Uh, actually, it's a meta surface. Maybe you may have heard. Uh, it is not a new concept. I will also provide a historical perspective later on. So uh, it is a smart device which has unique electromagnetic capabilities. In, in, in short terms, we can define a reconfigurable intelligent surface as this. So for instance, a reconfigurable surface uh, consisting of a small low cost and passive elements what we call passive there is no radio signal processing so it gets the signal and scatters uh, the signal into the environment by modifying the incident signal so uh, there are many different architectures in the literature for reconfigurable intelligence surfaces it can be periodic it can be non-periodic so it can be uniform it can be non-uniform there are different architectures for instance we envision here a reflect ray type intelligence surface so uh, it consisting it consists of meta atoms what is a meta atom actually it's just a single reflecting element so uh, how this intelligent surface works actually it's a very basic physics idea when you have an incident field the incident field creates a current distribution current create creates currents on the patch element, on this conducting element, and we have switch elements. What are those switch elements? These are pin diodes, varactors, and MEM switches, and so on. Uh, by manipulating these switch elements, for instance, a pin diode, and you are adjusting this on of status, or a varactor diode, and you are adjusting the heat voltage. And by manipulating these switch elements, you manipulate the current distribution on the uh, tiny element, and you I mean, uh, somehow manipulate the emitted field. So the, this is the working principle of an intelligent surface. So this is, I mean, we can call it some kind of a re-engineering of the electromagnetic base. So there are different ways to do it. For instance, you can manipulate the impedances. You, you might have some, uh, <laughs> if a director does this, you can manipulate the impedances. Oh, Quink is also here. Uh, so uh, for instance, you can have delay lines at the background uh, so, uh, and we, you can have many different delay lines with different lengths, and you can switch between the delay lines and in, you can adjust the, uh, I mean, phase delay, some sort of. So you can change the impedance, you can change the phase. So, uh, and some using sophisticated RS architectures, you can uh, enable other exotic uh, functionalities like absorption, polarization change, I mean, uh, re uh, I mean uh, reflection, direction change. So, uh, by the way, I have to admit, I'm not an electromagnetic guy. So, therefore, in today's presentation, we will focus uh, from the perspective of uh, communication, signal processing, and information theory. But definitely, it requires a joint effort, a multidisciplinary effort from many different fields. Uh, but particularly, I will try to uh, give a perspective uh, from the, I mean, perspective of communications engineering. 
So uh, what are the potential use cases? For instance, the most potential use cases, you can modify the power delay profile, for instance. So how you can do this? Uh, for instance, you are in the back room with a block line of sight. So there is an intelligence surface here. You have the access point. This intelligence surface gets the incoming signal and it steers it towards the room in which you are sitting, for instance. So you can modify the power delay profile. So you can reduce the number of multipaths. You can increase the receive signal power. We have also some recent works. You can reduce the Doppler effect, for instance. This is the most popular use case. Or another objective might be enabling energy harvesting. So you can use the intelligent surface to maximize the energy harvesting efficiency. Or you can use it to, uh, I mean, block unauthorized users for eavesdropping because an intelligent surface can be configured to fully absorb the incoming signal as well. And using this property, you can, I mean, block unauthorized users as well. For instance, another application here, for instance, there's a user here at the back and intelligent surface, uh, many intelligent surfaces may, might be used to provide connectivity to this far user. But you can ask this question, can we cover all walls with intelligent surfaces? Uh, is this feasible? What is the total cost? Actually, uh, in my opinion, it is not feasible. We cannot cover whole walls with intelligent surfaces. So there is an interesting optimization problem. For instance, I can give you only two intelligent surfaces and you might try to find the optimum locations of it. Right now we are uh, working actively in that frontier. So it is not feasible to cover all places. So it's a very interesting uh, optimization problem. So again, uh, for propagation channel enhancement in different environments, for instance, we can use intelligent surface in roadside, I mean, units, for instance, in order to reduce the Doppler effect, in order to reduce the multipath effect. So we can use it in maybe indoor uh, hot spots in shopping malls to provide more users to, uh, to increase the uh, sum rate capacity. Or uh, hopefully when the COVID is over, hopefully we can go back to these crowded places. So uh, maybe we can use intelligent surfaces again uh, to provide high quality of service in this kind of uh, crowded uh, spaces. So you may ask this question again, how effective? Uh, it's an interesting research problem. Right now we are also trying to understand the killer applications, potential use cases of intelligent surfaces. So uh, we will see, we will see. I will also show you uh, several numerical examples on how an intelligent surface can make a big difference in the receive signal quality, for instance. So uh, we will return to back into these uh, potential uh, use cases. So before jumping into these use cases and historical perspective, I want to briefly discuss the similarities and differences of intelligent surfaces with the existing technologies that are used in modern wireless communication systems. So uh, for instance, uh, I mean, co compared to relaying, I, I will show it later on. So it is, in my opinion, completely different compared to this existing massive MIMO relaying and beamforming because we have an incoming signal. There is no radio frequency processing. So there is no decoding. There is no encoding. There is no RF down conversion. There is no up conversion. There is no analog to digital, digital to analog conversion. There is no power amplification. There are no mixers and filters. So from this perspective, it is different. So it is a nearly passive nature. So when, when I say fully passive, I receive huge criticism from reviewers because we need some kind of a power at the background in order to control those switch elements. So that, that's the reason why we are calling it uh, nearly passive. It is not fully passive, but at least we don't have uh, power. We don't need power for this radio frequency signal operation. So that's the reason why it is uh, nearly passive. Uh, there is no noise amplification compared to relaying because there is no down conversion, up conversion. So. Uh, these are the unique features of the intelligent surfaces. Let us make a comparison with relaying, actually we discussed, so uh, with AF relaying and DF relaying. For instance, AF relaying and DF relaying, they actively process the incoming signal, they amplify them, retransmit them, and because of these processes, they are inherently half duplex. But intelligent surfaces, they are inherently full duplex because there is no radio fre frequency signal processing. The uh, for hardware complexity, you need a dedicated power source for RF equipment. Uh, fortunately, we don't need power amplifiers, mixers, or both uh, analog digital converters, uh, intelligent surfaces. In terms of cost, again, uh, since it is a passive element, it's some kind of a refractory antenna, uh, it's a low cost element, so its total cost is relatively lower compared to an active radio frequency device. 
And in terms of noise, uh, there is no receiver noise in the intelligence surface because, again, there is no radio frequency conversion. There is no up conversion, down conversion. Therefore, uh, it is not affected by noise. But for an AF relay, for instance, noise amplification is a serious concern. For decode and forward relay, uh, you need sophisticated uh, error uh, correction here because otherwise, if you make an error, you can uh, propagate the error. So this is a I mean, concern for uh, DF relaying as well. In terms of passive reflect arrays, a passive reflect arrays are known in the field of electromagnetics and antenna theory maybe for more than 15 years. Uh, and they are used, as far as I know, in practice as well. They support only normal reflection. So you don't have any modification. You cannot uh, manipulate the incoming signals. But uh, emission uh, as an intelligent surface, you can emission it as an active reflect array. For instance, here, if we have an intelligent surface composed of 20 tiny, uh, I mean, reflecting elements, meta atoms, they are, let's say, uh, half wavelength separated. And we can have an independent phase modification for each of them. So there's a single incoming signal. There are no, no 20 different incoming signals. So this is just the illustration. So we can modify the phase of the incoming signal, for instance. So uh, this is by far the most popular application in the field of communications and signal processing because it provides us many opportunities that I will show. So in, uh, let us compare it with backscatter communication. So uh, I have to admit that they are both passive because Backscatter communication in ambient backscatter communication, uh, it also harvests, uh, uses the existing electromagnetic signals uh, existing in the environment. So that's the reason why there's a conceptual uh, similarity. So, um, but a backscatter device generally encodes its own information to the incoming signals. Intelligent reflecting surface or reconfigured intelligent surface, uh, it might have its own information or it can just uh, play the role of a relay. So it's not necessary to ha have its own information. And more importantly, this phi matrix is, represents the uh, matrix of diagonal matrix of reflection coefficients, uh, the responses of uh, reflecting elements. So this is unique to uh, intelligent surfaces. So we don't have this in backscatter communications, but we have to admit they are both passive and can we say that they are close relatives? In my opinion, we can say they are close relatives. In my opinion, uh, it shares more similarity with backscatter communications compared to relaying, but it's my personal opinion. So um, this is an example uh, that, that we gave in our first paper appeared in 2019. It's our tutorial paper in this topic. So, uh, I mean, we need the started point, and uh, we picked this ground reflection model from Andre Gossin's book. So, it's a very popular model. You can see it in Rapoport's book, Andreas Moniz's book. So, it's by far the most popular, one of the most popular, um, uh, I mean, uh, models in wireless communications. He, here, we have a linocyte component and ground reflected component. We assume that uh, the transmitter and receiver are separated far enough. Uh, so they are in far field of each other. And uh, since they are separated enough, the surface of the Earth can be approximated as flat. Uh, so it's a smooth and flat surface. And there's a ground reflection point. Uh, according to the I mean, ray optics, you can imagine that there's a mirror of the transmitter here. It's a, it's a ground reflection occurs. So that's the reason why this is the ground reflecting signal and this is the line of sight signal. So if you do the maths, the, the details is in Andre Gossin's book, you can see it. So uh, due to this, unfortunately, uh, destructive interference of the ground reflected signal to the uh, line of sight signal, your receive signal power is a function of transmit signal power, distance rise to the power of four. So this is again a very well-known formula in wireless communications, fourth power law. So receive signal power decays with the fourth power of distance. What about pure line of sight? Free space equation says that receive signal power decays with the second power of the distance, as you know. So we see the destructive effect of multipath propagation because you have multipath here, and you cannot always guarantee that they, I mean, constructively combine. So if you can ensure that they can constructively combine, so if you have a mechanism to control this R coefficient, the ground reflection coefficient, if you can ensure that they constructively combine, maybe you can have a chance compared to free space propagation. But as you see, if they are, 
I mean, uh, the, their phases are not aligned, you can have a serious, I mean, uh, reduction in your receive signal power. So we had a vision almost a year ago. Uh, our vision was, can we have an intelligent surface here <coughs> at this point? Can we have an intelligent surface? It is relatively large. Assume that specular reflection occurs. I know this is not possible in practice because in order to have specular reflection, those intelligent surface might be huge. I know it is not possible, but assume that <clears throat> we have an intelligent surface at this point. It is a huge intelligent surface and I can adjust this R reflection coefficient. So if I can adjust this R to match the phase of the ground reflected signal with the line of sight signal, in that case, I can return back to uh, ordinary line of sight transmission with received signal power decayed with the second power of the distance. This is highly optimistic and not realistic. I'm saying this, so I'm not arguing that this is realistic. This, this is unrealistic, but assume that I have a large intelligent surface with many tiny elements. Unfortunately, those tiny elements uh, scatters the incoming signal. We don't have ground reflection anymore, but we have an additional term here, the n square term, n is the number of uh, tiny elements in this intelligent surface. And in later studies, it has been shown that if you carefully position the intelligent surface and if you can adjust its size carefully, you can at least challenge this line of sight uh, path. So th this is the vision. This is the vision. So uh, it can be control the uh, I mean, reflection coefficient in order to align the phases of different multipath components. So this is the starting point uh, in understanding of intelligent surfaces. So after our work, actually many guys from electromagnetic field also jumped into this topic. So it triggered a new uh, field of research and they also developed some models from electromagnetic theory. So we are also working in that direction. I will also show. So uh, it is possible. So it is possible. Uh, there is a huge potential, so hopefully uh, we will be able to discuss all this in the upcoming slides. So uh, that, when we first starting, I mean, uh, understanding uh, intelligent surfaces almost two years ago, when I first, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, when I first saw this topic by the early works of some colleagues from, uh, I mean, uh, Singapore uh and some colleagues from china in, in their early papers in 2018 so um, i saw that there was a i mean uh, i mean uh, I, I realized that there is no mathematical framework in the literature to assess the potential of the performance of the uh, receive signal because i have been working on this kind of uh, theoretical analysis uh, since my phd years so uh, this, this is a reflectory type intelligence surface so HI characterizes the uh, wireless channel between the source and height reflecting element. GI is the channel between the height reflecting element and, and the receiver. So uh, this is our end-to-end -end, uh, channel model. So due to this scattering effect, this is a multiplicative uh, term. This is like cascaded fading in uh, early times. So we have this VI. VI is the adjustable phase of the height reflecting element. And we assume that we control it by a microcontroller at the backside, for instance. So our task here is to maximize the received signal to noise ratio by adjusting this VI term. Actually, it's very straightforward. So if you have this phases of this forward path and reverse path, if you can adjust the phase of the reflecting element in order to compensate of the phases of these two paths, you can have the maximum uh, I mean, receive signal to noise ratio. So uh, th then we first, uh, I mean, jump into this topic. As far as I remember, there were no uh, theoretical, uh, I mean, backgrounds. Uh, there were no theoretical proof that a received SNR follows a certain distribution. So what was the, uh, I mean, relationship between this N? N is the number of reflecting elements in the intelligent surface and received SNR. Actually, when you compensate these phases, if N is large enough, According to the central limit theorem, whatever the distribution of amplitudes, alpha and beta are amplitudes, whatever the distribution is, according to the central limit theorem, so uh, the inside becomes Gaussian and square of it becomes chi square distribution. And from that point, we derived uh, the uh, similar probability, theoretical probability after that, 
uh, of uh, reconfigurable intelligent surface assisted uh, wireless communication systems. In our initial analysis, we ignored path loss. Uh, so it was a starting point because uh, we didn't consider path loss. So this blue curve is the famous curve that you know in wireless com uh, digital communications. This is the, I mean, bitter probability curve of BPS key in AVGN channel. So as you see, uh, we have a, a waterfall effect and a saturation effect in the received signal to noise rate, uh, received bitter rate with respect to signal to noise ratio. We have also mathematically proved uh, why we have these. Uh, I mean, in the bitter probability, we have mathematically proved this. So, but we have to admit, in order to realize this uh, huge improvement in bitter probability, we need uh, phases knowledge at the RIS because I, I need to uh, adjust the phases according to the phases of forward and reverse paths. So it is not easy, but in my opinion, it is feasible, but not easy, I have to admit. So, uh, but there is a huge potential uh, according to our initial theoretical uh, analysis. So later on, we also showed that received SNR uh, is a function of n square. n is the number of reflecting elements. Therefore, if you double the n, you observe 6 dB improvement, fourfold decrease in the required signal to noise ratio in order to achieve a target with error rate probability. So this is also a, a significant uh, improvement and very promising result in terms of uh, the potential of, uh, I mean, uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces. Again, in this curve, we ignored path loss. So that's the reason why we have these huge improvements, but uh, the story is here. Even if we ignore the path loss, the story is here. By increasing N, you can improve uh, the, I mean, bitter probability. You can improve the SNR uh, requirements. So this is what we saw. So, uh, after covering these basics, uh, let me briefly focus on the origins, then I will focus on the applications and our most recent, I mean, uh, research efforts in this direction. Actually, it is not a new concept, I have to admit. It is not a new concept. Uh, so, uh, I have picked some notable applications from the past few years. For instance, we have intelligent walls in 2012, that they developed by uh, some guys. Uh, so, actually, it's an intelligent wall. Maybe the figure is a little bit slow. Uh, there are a pin diodes here. Uh, it's a wall. These are again uh, patch type elements, conducting elements. And pin diodes, the authors are adjusting on of status of these pin diodes. And by adjusting their on of status, they have a transparent wall or a fully reflective wall. Uh, this was their vision in 2012, and they call it intelligent wall. So later on, we have coding metamaterials from guys, uh, from colleagues from uh, Southeast University, China, coding metamaterials. This is the unit cell of their prototype. This is their prototype. This is the unit cell. As you see, it is a, I mean, non-periodic uh, metasurface. So there's a pin diode here again, and uh, the, it has two states, on and off. A pin diode has two states. With these two states, they enable two different phases, zero and phi, and they, I mean, realize reconfigurable scattering patterns, for instance. Uh, this is the uh, intelligent reconfigurable reflector ray from 2016, Hornet et al. Uh, by the way, it's also a very promising design. It's a reflector ray type antenna. Uh, the, the reflector ray, is, as you see, is a patch antenna element, and they are, I mean, separated by half of the wavelength. So there are varactor diodes in between. And the authors propose adjusting the voltages of vector diodes in order to realize adjustable reflection phase. So these are the notable three examples from the past. Uh, but I have to admit, we have a large intelligent surface, LIS. It is a little bit different than the reconfigurable intelligent surface that we will present today because large intelligent surface is a, some kind of active surface uh, with transmission reception. It's a, some kind of antenna. It's a one step beyond massive MIMO. So, uh, but in 2018, this uh, hypersurface from Weisel Surf Project Group, uh, they have this hypersurface. So I have to admit, it created a new line of research. It creates a renewed interest on these uh, intelligent uh, surfaces. So in the past two years, uh, as you may have noticed from the literature, 
several papers published in the literature. Uh, so it is impossible to cover all of them in today's, uh, I mean, 75 minutes of presentation. Uh, I will just briefly focus on main studies, main works, and I will try to provide the perspectives and potential applications. Actually, uh, I have to say, uh, there are many different terminologies in the literature. Uh, and when you see one of them, please don't get confused. Reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, large intelligence surfaces, smart reflect array, smart environments, programmable environments, programmable wireless devices, intelligent reflecting surfaces is also very popular. Uh, but I don't prefer intelligent reflecting surfaces because, I mean, they are not reflecting surface, they are scattering mostly. That's the reason why it's not maybe uh, scientifically accurate. So uh, passive intelligent mirrors, hyper surfaces, programmable meta surfaces, artificial radio space, there are many different terminologies. So we prefer reconfigurable intelligent surfaces because it's by far the most popular. And I mean, uh, it, I think covers all many aspects of these uh, devices. So many different applications like, I mean, theoretical derivations for single user, multi-user systems, MIMO systems, channel estimation problems, joint active and passive beam forming studies since the early times. There are uh, recent uh, practical implementation campaigns, physical layer security, co uh, cognitive radio application to different areas. So I will briefly cover all of them, but only the initial studies because maybe we will need a full day tutorial in order to cover uh, all major studies in this field. Uh, so I will briefly cover all of them. Uh, but before jumping that, uh, let me briefly summarize what we are doing right now uh, in my laboratory, Core Lab in Koch University. So right now, uh, in the past couple of months, particularly during those COVID days when we are, I mean, locked in our homes in Turkey, uh, it was uh, forbidden to go outside during weekends and national holidays during, I mean, uh, March, April, and May. So we had a lot of time to sit at home and think. So what is the open problem? What is the open problem? So if we solve that, uh, there is a need for a channel modeling in different environments. There is a need for an open source channel model. Uh, our most recent research focused in this direction. So uh, we have uh, works focusing on novel MIMO system designs and index modulation based solutions. So uh, we are exploring normal based solutions for multi-user systems. Right now we are also exploring uh, applications for vehicular and UAV networks, some basic works published in the literature in the past couple of months. Uh, this is just an idea, we don't know, we are just thinking whether can we use these intelligent surfaces for COVID-19, maybe to uh, monitor uh, the, I mean, the patients or do some kind of, I mean, check social distancing. So we will see. So we have just some ideas, not nothing published. So, <laughs> so just an idea. So um, as we discussed, uh, our recent uh, research focused on physical channel modeling. So what we did. Actually, we jumped into 5G standardization documents in order to understand the 5G channel model. Actually, we considered the 5G millimeter wave 3D channel model with random numbers of clusters and scatterers. So we took these dimensions from 5G standard. This is an indoor hotspot environment, for instance. So 75 meters is the length of the large indoor office environment. Up to 50 meters is the width. So we Consider that we have an access point here, we have a receiver here, and we put an intelligent surface at the side wall, or we put it here in the opposite wall. So if we, this, this was our emission, and we modeled the line of sight probability. We also modified it, I will show it uh, very briefly. We modeled shadowing effects, shared clusters, because we envisioned that receiver is in the close proximity of the RIS, because uh, due to scattering effect, unfortunately, uh, the receive signal power decays very fast. Uh, therefore, your RAS must be either close to transmitter or receiver. Otherwise, you might not even notice the difference in the receive signal power. I will show you some numerical examples. And more importantly, we considered the realistic array response, realistic gains of this intelligence surface. So we considered array type intelligence surface here, reflect array type. I mean, uh, this is not... Uh, a compact design. Uh, actually, there are reflecting elements that are separated by half of the wavelength in our initial design. So uh, we made channel modeling for both indoors and outdoors. For outdoors, we generated clusters between transmitter and RIS, RIS and receiver, transmitter and receiver. 
Actually, according to the 5G standard, you generate these clusters, number of clusters is a Poisson, Poisson distributed random variable. The number of scatterers per each cluster is a uniform random variable. You generate these, uh, I mean, uh, elevation and you generate this elevation and azimuth angles randomly. But uh, we made some modifications here because according, uh, since the array has a fixed orientation on the wall, when you generate a cluster randomly, this elevation and azimuth angles for the RAS are no longer random. So this was what we saw during our channel modeling because in 5G channel model, uh, due to random orientation of the receiver, these arrival angles are also modeled randomly, but RAS has a fixed orientation. It's mounted on the wall. It has a fixed orientation. Therefore, if you generate cluster randomly, this elevation and uh, azimuth departure angles randomly, this arrival angles becomes deterministic. So this is very interesting. So uh, we considered all of these and uh, we published this Simris Channel Simulator version 1.0 almost two months ago. It's an open source. You can click on this link. You can download it. Uh, it's also source code is open. So uh, you can, I mean, investigate its steps. So you are selecting the environment. Right now we have only indoor office and uh, Orbin Macrocellular Street Canyon. You are selecting the location of the RAS. It could be in the side wall or opposite wall. You are selecting it. You are selecting frequency, 28 gigahertz, 78 gigahertz. Right now we are supporting. You are selecting number of RAS elements, number of channel realizations. And more importantly, you are selecting the XYZ coordinates of the transmitter receiver and RAS and you just hit run seamless button and it generates the uh, channels for you. So uh, I'm very, I mean, uh, honored and proud to say that I wrote the source code by myself during COVID days. Uh, fortunately, we had COVID because without COVID, uh, I wouldn't uh, find time to uh, focus on this thing. My PhD student helped me with this graphical user interface. So I forgot how to, I mean, they create these beautiful user interfaces in MATLAB. So it is open source. You can click and download it all the time. So according to our channel modeling uh, campaign, we have some interesting results. The first interesting result is uh, the closer to the RAS, it is better. When you are far away from the RAS, this is the receiver. Actually, these are 10 test points uh, for the receiver in a realistic indoor environment. Uh, according to this 5G channel model, millimeter wave channel model at 28 gigahertz, these numbers at the top are the achievable rate with RAS, numbers at the bottom rate without RAS. So as you see, when we are close to the RAS, we observe a significant improvement. But when you are far away from the RAS, so this is the cutoff distance, 10 meters, as you see, the difference becomes smaller. Therefore, the closer to the RAS, the better. This is our first conclusion. Our second conclusion is loss line of sight paths are decisive. So what I mean by this? So let us see the blue curve. The blue curve is the achievable rate of a system without RAS in an indoor office environment, 28 gigahertz. So a uh, size of system, single input, single output, according to the 5G channel model. So then we have an intelligent surface in the side wall. Uh, actually, by the way, it is pretty close to the receiver, just a couple of meters. It, it, it is in the far field, but there are no clusters between RAS and receiver. There's a pure line of sight path between RAS and receiver. But assume that we mount it at 1.5 meter height. So according to the 5G model, when the uh, distance between the transmitter and receiver is less than, let's say, 50 meters, so you have a very small line of sight probability. As far as I remember, it was 2% or 3%. Then when you lose the line of sight between transmitter and RAS, uh, you have a huge path loss uh, due to scattering. And as you see, even if you have 64 and 256 reflecting elements, the increase in capacity, achievable rate, is not significant. But we modified the line of sight probability in 5G standard. So assume that the access point is mounted at 2 meters, the config intelligence surface is also mounted at two meters. Even if we have a 50 meters separation between them, since they are both at two meters, there, there could be a clear line of sight path between them in an indoor office, indoor environment. Therefore, we modified the line of sight probability and we adjusted equal to one. As you see, when there is a clear line of sight between transmitter and RAS, there is a huge improvement in achievable rate. So, that's the reason why this is our conclusion. 
line of sight paths are decisive. So intelligent surface likes those line of sight paths very much because without line of sight path, you have a weak signal coming to the intelligent surface, you are scattering it, and you have an even weaker signal at the receiver. So that's the reason why the increase is not significant when the line of sight is blocked between transmitter and RAS. Uh, last week, we released Simris version 2.0. Uh, we added MIMO capability here, transmitter and receiver. Right now, they are MIMO. Uh, we can also adjust the trans number of transmit antennas, number of receiver antennas, and uh, we can sell a uniform linear array or planar array for the transmitter or receiver. RAS is a planar array, uh, so uh, you can adjust again all locations and other parameters. It is also available here. Uh, and uh, it came with a visionary article uh, here. You can also just publish a month ago, a week ago. So uh, we discuss both this uh, Simbis, uh, its earlier version and this updated version. And we also present our future uh, perspectives on, uh, I mean, reconfigurable intelligent uh, surfaces. This is again one of the results we recently obtained. Here in a MIMO system, Instead of increasing number of transmit or receive antennas, you can increase the size of the RAS and you can observe a similar improvement in the achievable rate. This is what this figure says to us. So again, the closer to the RAS is better. As you see, uh, we have a, I mean, these are the receiver locations in X and Y dimensions. This is the RAS location. When you are closer to the RAS, as you see, uh, there is a, a significant jump in the achievable rate. And we also envisioned a scenario in which there are two intelligent surfaces. As you see, when you get closer to the intelligent surface, maybe it's possible to hand over from one RAS to another RAS, because as you see, when you are in the middle, your achievable rate drops uh, very uh, quickly. So let me uh, briefly summarize the emerging applications of intelligent surfaces multi-user MIMO, normal physical layer security. So recent studies uh, focused on use of intelligent surfaces and access point. We see the first studies focusing on UAV networks, vehicular networks, OFTM, visible light communications, index modulation, localization is a very interesting application. We have several papers on deep learning, use of deep learning is also a very I mean, interesting direction uh, for the future. Uh, so let me briefly cover again, as we discussed earlier, I need a full day tutorial, uh, maybe seven hours to uh, cover all these, these applications because uh, there are several papers in the literature, it's impossible to cover all of them. And I will touch the initial studies. I will touch the initial studies and most promising studies uh, you may, I mean, take a deep look into the li literature to understand. Uh, so, uh, for instance, one of the early use cases of intelligent services for multi-user systems. So you can use intelligent services to support multiple users. For instance, these are the actually the first two journal papers in the literature, as far as I know, uh, from colleagues from Singapore. I think King King is also here in the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I think uh, Huang, uh, these uh, colleagues, so uh, these are the first papers. Uh, the authors tried to maximize the uh, signal to interference noise ratio or sum rate by adjusting this phi matrix. This is the reflection coefficients matrix and also playing with this uh, active beamforming at the transmitter side. So uh, we have to say, according to our uh, practical uh, physical channel modeling campaign recently, it is an effective solution, but when the base station user link is not strong enough, so when this link is very strong, unfortunately, what we saw, see from our recent uh, physical channel modeling uh, studies, when this link is very strong, the intelligent surface might not create a very big difference. Uh, so, but when the line of sight is blocked or it is not very strong enough, uh, it definitely uh, create a huge boost uh, for the achievable rate. So uh, this is a very interesting application. Uh, actually, independently from the guys, uh, colleagues from Southeast University, they developed the prototype. Uh, I developed the theory almost uh, one and a half years ago, independently uh, with my all, I mean, uh, honesty, I say that we developed this concept independently. So when I first uh, solved this intelligent surface, 
so uh, I inspired from the earlier works of uh, colleagues from China and Singapore, they were adjusting the reflection phases. So this was the idea that came to our mind. Can we use these phases in order to transmit information? Can we create a virtual phase shift gain constellation? Actually, uh, the RAS plays the role of an axis point in this scenario. We are illuminating the RAS with an unmodulated cosine uh, and we are manipulating these phases in order to create a virtual PSK constellation. So we developed a theory. Uh, we, I mean, uh, published this work uh, in last year in UCNC and colleagues from China, they provide the prototype and they say that it is possible to reach a couple of megabits per second using this radio frequency chain free virtual 8 PSK uh, I mean, uh, type uh, transmitter. So this was their uh, motivation. But they use multiple uh, DC uh, ducts here. Uh, actually, you don't even need multiple ducts. You can even simplify this design. But the use of intelligent surface is, is a simple transmitter. In my opinion, I think it is the feature of intelligent surface because when the intelligent surface is close to transmitter, it can create a big difference in the received signal strength. So that's the reason why I'm saying that it is one of the very promising future directions. So we have been working on index modulation for a very long time. Uh, therefore, uh, one of the first ideas was combining index modulation with these intelligent surfaces. So in our initial study, uh, we combined the receive index modulation with intelligent surfaces here. If according to the information base, we adjust phases and we activate one of the receive antennas. Later on, we combined it with spatial modulation, space shifting. According to the information base, uh, we are activating an antenna and intelligent surface helps us to, uh, I mean, uh, reflect our signal to the receiver. Again, uh, you can use an intelligent surface to create a virtual MIMO uh, system. Again, independently from uh, Southeast University guys, we have this design. Uh, I mean, it, it is right now uh, accepted in IEEE Systems Journal. So we are dividing the service into half. Uh, we created a virtual Alamuti scheme. Uh, maybe you know Alamuti scheme if you worked on space-time codes. It was my Master of Science thesis was based on space-time codes <laughs> almost a century ago. So um, the first half, as you see, uh, transmits the first symbol, second half transmits the second symbol, and second time slot we cross the symbols. So this was the idea from uh, Southeast University guys. They are dividing the service. The first part transmit S1, second part transmit S2. They are mimicking special multiplexing. We are trying to mimic Alamuti scheme. So do we need cost the RF chains anymore? Yes. I mean, it's a very promising uh, I mean, uh, implementation architecture for the transmitter side because here we don't have a radio frequency chain. Here they also have the prototype, as far as I know, they don't have a, uh, I mean, radio frequency chain, just the carrier signal, power amplifier, and so on. So it's a very simple uh, architecture to create virtual MISO, MIMO systems. Physical layer security, I will skip the details. Uh, it can be used to increase the secrecy rate. Uh, you can play with intelligent surface and it might create a new opportunity for you to increase the, uh, I mean, uh, secrecy rate. And you can do it by, I mean, degradating the signal at the use dropper or improving the signal at the user. Again, these are the initial works in the literature from Singapore guys and uh, Robert Schobert and his colleagues. So there's a huge potential, I have to admit. So it has another dimension for file security. And we, I have to admit, it is an important missing feature in 5G. Uh, therefore, intelligent services might appear as a potential enabler for future uh, file security systems. Later on, some advanced solutions using more than single intelligent surface for uh, e e more than single uh, eavesdropper and multiple users. It's a joint optimization problem. Uh, it is not easy, I have to admit, when you have multiple intelligent surfaces, their coordination, uh, their adjustment is not easy, but there is potential in terms of I mean, information theory, communication theory. So vehicular networks is again, in the past couple of months, we have the first studies. You can either use it uh, to enhance security to overcome the line of sight blockers. And more importantly, uh, you can use it for sensing, pedestrian detection. This is a very interesting uh, application area, I have to admit. Again, it's a very open uh, direction. So what about NOAA? 
Uh, I know uh, we have some uh, experts here, maybe NOMA experts as well. I also worked on NOMA in the past couple of years. So, uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, NOMA is no longer on the table for uh, 6G for uh, higher releases. But can we have an effective NOMA 2.0 by intelligent surfaces? The initial studies, the initial works state that, yes, we can have very promising uh, NOMA solutions. Uh, using intelligent surface. These are again the initial studies uh, from, I mean, uh, Vincent Poor and uh, Dink, Professor Dink from Manchester. They envision a system like this with multiple intelligent surfaces. Again, in one of the initial studies, the authors use it to support multiple users. This is our recent study with colleagues from Yuan Wei, uh, from Queen Mary University at Octavia. So uh, here we envisioned uh, users in clusters. Uh, and we use an intelligent surface to support connectivity uh, in millimeter waves using NOMA architecture and we obtain promising results when the direct link is blocked. So can we have an effective NOMA 2.0? Uh, we will see maybe intelligent surface might be uh, a I mean, good solution uh, to I mean, return back to NOMA, so I have to say. So low complexity mining is interesting direction. Uh, we are also working in this with my PhD student because when you jump into the earlier studies, you see that there are optimization, non-convex optimization, and uh, those kind of problems. Some authors use CVS package. So as far as I know, I, I didn't use CVS package by, by my own, but my PhD student says that uh, it takes a lot of time to run the CVS package. So therefore, we are uh, looking for solutions in which there are no iterations, and we can just obtain, optimize these reflection phases using this channel uh, matrices. Uh, we developed a cosi similarity based low complex algorithm. It works. It is not as powerful as the ones based on CVX, non-convex optimization, but it is very simple. It, is not, it, it doesn't have any iterations and it can easily adjust the phases. It could be inspired one of the early works uh, from Professor Hanzo. Uh, they also consider uh, some kind of a zero forcing type uh, I mean, uh, reflection phase modification. On the rest of the networks, it is also one of the emerging applications. We can use intelligent surfaces to overcome the line of sight blockage uh, to support also terrestrial networks and support aerial users and also for backhauling. But you may ask this question, how practical? I'm also right now questioning this thing. So whether is it physical, uh, I mean, practical to put the intelligent surface on the UAV? In my personal opinion, I will show in the later slides, we have also a very small prototype. It is not very easy to put on the uh, UAV. So it is a little bit maybe optimistic, but maybe we can put, uh, I mean, uh, surface to the ground to support UAV. So we can put a surface here near to the user and we can use it to support the incoming signal from the UAV. So it's a very interesting problem. Are you at the ground or air? Uh, some initial studies are also available in the literature. Cognitive radio, again, uh, it might use to improve the rate of secondary user uh, considerably. It's a very interesting uh, direction as well. Uh, Doppler mitigation, actually it's an early work of us. Uh, it is still under review. Uh, I mean, um, in my opinion, it's one of the areas which is not fully explored and understood. Because if it's an intelligent surface, you create some kind of a phase. You can delay the incoming signal. Actually, Doppler shift also creates some kind of a phase term in your incoming signal. So can I use this in order to compensate the Doppler shift? Yes, the answer is yes. For instance, in this simple case, assume that your mobile station is moving. I have an interacting object here. As you see, when this mobile station moves, we have a fade pattern due to Doppler shifts, due to the, uh, I mean, uh, destructive and constructive interference of the direct path and line of uh, reflected path. Here we consider specular reflection. Assume that there is an intelligent surface here. Again, in this very simple scenario, we consider a specular reflection, but we are still working on it. We need to modify it by physical channel models. So if we can adjust the phase accordingly, I can convert this time varying channels into time invariant channel. According to the theory, it is possible, uh, but as we discussed, so we, we considered specular reflection here in the interacting object, so we need to modify uh, that model. So assume that there are 
many interacting objects in the environment, let's say 10 interacting objects, so you observe a complex envelope in this format. So this is actually the Rayleigh complex envelope. This is a Rayleigh type complex envelope. As you see, this is Doppler spectrum. This is the line of sight. This is the, uh, I mean, uh, incoming signals for all other reflectors. But can we have an intelligent, some kind of interacting objects in the environment, all of them are intelligent, all of them control the incoming signal. This is again highly optimistic. I'm, I'm admitting this, it's highly optimistic, but if we can adjust the phases of all these paths to the line of sight path, we can create only a signal component in the Doppler spectrum in return a flat uh, complex envelope. How practical? It is not practical, we are still working on it. So we can use it for coverage extension in indoor and outdoor environments envisioned in 6G. So for instance, in an indoor environment, you can have multiple intelligent surfaces to forward your signal for an outdoor environment. You can have an, in multiple intelligent surfaces to overcome the line of sight blockage here. Again, if you have multiple surfaces, optimum intelligent surface selection and positioning is a very interesting and open uh, problem. Again, colleagues from Singapore uh, they first, uh, I mean, introduced the use of OFTM with intelligent surfaces. You can ask this question. They also have this frame structure, this unique frame structure. Can I use intelligent surfaces with Wi-Fi? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, because it is also possible to have a very efficient OFTM-based uh, intelligent reflecting surface-assisted uh, communication uh, systems. So a very interesting application for sensing or sensing a posture recognition. So uh, again, colleagues, uh, Vincent Poor uh, and some other colleagues show that it can be used to improve the accuracy of posture rec recognition for maybe future artificial intelligence applications. Again, radio localization is a very interesting application beyond communication. Uh, and some initial studies also appeared in the literature. Uh, it can be used to overcome line of sight blockage and particularly in near field it creates, I mean, uh, there are very interesting open problems in near field as well, in near field uh, localization. Let us, I mean, wrap up the applications. So uh, as we discussed earlier, I need several hours to cover all of them. Uh, so there are also some applications that I didn't touch here in this presentation. For instance, application with Massive MIMO appears as a very interesting direction, deep learning, two-way full duplex communications, multiple access schemes, cooperative communications, uh, energy harvesting systems, it also creates a new direction. Uh, particularly, there are uh, several papers I've seen in the literature on device-to-device -device communications. First papers in the literature appeared in optical wireless communications and healthcare. It's very interesting, uh, I mean, verticals to apply intelligent services. Again, hybrid designs, uh, so relay-aided intelligent surface, it's a very interesting direction, in my opinion, again, to do research. So uh, this figure is from our recent visionary article. So uh, we just summarize uh, the applications. So um, recently King King is also here uh, from uh, Singapore. Uh, they also have a very nice tutorial on intelligent reflecting surfaces. As far as I know, it's an invited paper in IEEE TCOM. So I also highly recommend it to you if you want to jump into this topic, it's up to date. Uh, so it uh, covers some very important aspects of intelligent uh, surfaces. So uh, at the last step, maybe uh, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not an electromagnetist guy, but let me briefly cover what is going on in the physical world in the recent practical implementation uh, campaigns. Actually, uh, this is the intelligent metasurface uh, design from the paper of Tredyakov et al. from 2019. This is an, I mean, a state of art intelligent surface. This is actually the unit cell of it. Uh, th there are two patch elements, they are copper, uh, they are uh, printed on a, a PCB, and uh, in between there is a tunable chip, it's a tunable RNC, resistance and capacitance, and the authors show that by adjusting resistance and capacitance, they can, I mean, full absorption at different polarizations, and they also state that by adjusting these RNC values, they can adjust uh, magnitude and phase of the reflected uh, signal, but they show it by simulations, but without any uh, practical experiments. So this is the prototype of hypersurface uh, visor surf group. A hypersurface is the name that used this uh, European Union project uh, started in uh, 
three years ago. So as far as I know, they built this prototype with the help of Fraunhofer uh, Institute, one of the institutes I couldn't remember right now. So uh, they prototype, they worked on this for three years, as far as I know, uh, but this is a very unique uh, prototype and they enable exotic functionalities like polarization change, uh, steering change, phase modification, I mean, focusing, etc. So this is uh, their uh, prototype. So uh, their unit cell consists of four uh, patch uh, elements. So uh, this is the prototype of Southeast University guys. Uh, according to my knowledge, it is one of the most sophisticated RS designs so far. Uh, their large design is consisting of uh, 100 times 102 unit cells. Uh, it's a huge matter surface, one times one, one meter square surface. Uh, and they report uh, also uh, promising results in this, I mean, uh, chamber, in their chamber. So uh, again, it's a very interesting uh, prototype, uh, I have to admit. So uh, this is the prototype of, uh, I mean, Tishinga guys, uh, Link Long Tai is also a colleague of mine. Uh, in their prototype, this is the unit cell, they have pin diodes and they're adjusting the on-off status of this pin diodes. And they say that it is possible to obtain four different phase shift values. So we didn't discuss this uh, due to time limitation, but in practice, you generally have a limited phase resolution. So you cannot have a full phase resolution in practice. So uh, these are the practical values they reported. And as a whole, as you see, they also use the intelligent surface as a transmitter. They report a gain of 21.7 DVI for 2.3 gigahertz operating frequency. This is a very promising prototype uh, from uh, University of San Diego, as far as I remember, they call it Scatter MIMO. Uh, actually, uh, it is quite consistent with our recent uh, physical uh, channel modeling campaign. They put this smart surface very close to the access point, and they envision that it creates a second special stream, a virtual stream. And they position it closely to the transmitter due to scattering. Uh, they need to ensure that the power of this green stream is at least as high as the blue stream. This is what they aim. So that's the reason why they have three tiles. Each tile contains 16 patch elements, four times four, a total of 48 patch elements. And they implement this by delay lines. I mean, they do not modify capacitor resistor. There are delay lines at the background and they are switching between delay lines in order to adjust the phase of the uh, scattering signal. And according to their uh, results, they are using uh, 802.11 AC OFTM system at 5 GHz for a bandwidth of 100 MHz. Uh, they say that it is possible to increase the coverage from 30 meters to 45 meters uh, with a power consumption less than uh, 14 megawatts. Uh, I'm sorry, not megawatts, minimums, correction. So uh, the, I am also receiving this criticism a lot. Is it practical? Is it practical? Can you implement this? Is it practical? I think this is a bold answer. Uh, so less than uh, 14 microwatts of power consumption, it is possible to increase the coverage from 30 meters to 45 meters. So that's the reason why there's a potential. Uh, but yes, it is not easy, but there is a potential. But these guys show that it is possible uh, with a, uh, I mean, a practical uh, experiment. This is our humble prototype. Uh, it is better than nothing. So uh, we, we fabricated this before the COVID days. Uh, I mean, uh, our lab is still closed. We are planning to open it by the start of September. Uh, but uh, this is actually a reflector type prototype. There are two varactor diodes. Uh, these are two patch elements. And we adjust the feed voltages by uh, Arduino, a microcontroller. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we will try. We, we are also trying, but uh, I have to admit, I'm not an, I mean, metasurface and electromagnetics expert, uh, but we just want to see maybe if we will try as the guys in Scatter MIMO, we will try to maybe uh, extend the range. We will do experiments uh, in that uh, perspective. So uh, to wrap up, actually the path loss, as we discussed earlier, unfortunately due to scattering, uh, actually, uh, Ellingston is uh, in his visionary paper appeared in archive in December. Uh, he showed that uh, the received signal power decays, unfortunately, with the square of 
R i square, R r square. So these are the distances from transmitter to RAS, RAS to receiver. This is the path attenuation uh, due to intelligent surface. And that's the reason why in order to reach specular reflection path loss, you need to carefully position the intelligent surface. Actually, Edison reported some results, but uh, I have to admit uh, his positioning was far from uh, perfect because here he reported that if the distance between transmitter and RAS is 100 meters, from the RAS to receiver is one kilometer, we need huge intelligent surfaces. Even at a 60 gigahertz, uh, we need almost, I mean, uh, one meter square, more than one meter square intelligent surface. It's a huge metal surface because in 60 gigahertz, wavelength is very small. Uh, so it would be a huge metal surface. Uh, so, uh, but I think it is far from optimal. So when this distance between transmitter and RAS is 100 meters, another one kilometer from here, it is uh, due to the scattering. Scattering is not merciful. Uh, you observe a significant decrease in the receive signal power. So what I recommend is let's put the intelligent surface in five meters, 10 meters of the transmitter or receiver. You can still be in the far field, uh, but uh, I think five meters and 10 meters uh, is the I mean, optimal range in order to observe significant uh, improvement in the receive signal strength. This is what we observed from our recent uh, practical uh, campaign. Fortunately, n square appears in the pad gain this is what we observed almost a year ago uh, from our theoretical analysis. Recent practical studies also verified this n square term. So we need a compact RAS design. Uh, we need to increase n. But in return, if you increase n, unfortunately, overhead increases, cost increases, channel, head uh, channel estimation becomes more complicated. Therefore, we need to find a balance. So it's not uh, easy. So uh, we also, our channel modeling campaign also inspired from Ellingston's idea. So uh, actually, this is our signal model uh, for a RAS transmitter receiver. These are the distances, uh, and this is a reflector ray type RAS. This is our signal model. If you adjust these phases, as we discussed earlier, you can obtain the maximum uh, receive signal power. But unfortunately, receive signal power decays with a n square, b n square, uh, due to this scattering effect. If you are in the far field, you can drop this n uh, subs uh, subscripts, but still you have a square and b uh, square. Therefore, careful positioning is needed because scattering is not merciful. But uh, during our channel modeling campaign, this was our starting point. We assume that there are multiple interacting objects between transmitter and RAS. And uh, what happens to the receive signal power? What happens to the signal model? This, this was our starting point. Uh, during those COVID days. Uh, as you see, when you have these interacting objects, th th these are actually scatterers. They have radar cross-sections. The signal transmitted uh, uh, scatters by these objects. It scatters again from the RAS and approaches to the receiver. Due to this effect, unfortunately, uh, your receive signal strength uh, scales by AM squared, BMN squared, and CN squared. So it's double scattering in, in the, I mean, wireless communication community. Again, that's the reason why careful positioning of the intelligent surface is vital. So if the CN distance is large, unfortunately, if there's a line of sight path here, uh, you cannot even notice the difference of intelligent surface. That's the reason why we envision that this distance is small. This distance is small. There's a clear line of sight here. There are no interacting objects in between. In this case, intelligent surface might be a game changer, might be a lifesaver, particularly when the line of sight path is blocked. So uh, let me, uh, I mean, uh, conclude my presentation with the open research issues uh, towards next generation wireless networks. I mean, the most important point is I think we need to bridge the gap between theoretical analysis and real world deployments. And to do this, yes, it requires multidisciplinary research efforts uh, with the contribution of academia and industry. So we need to find the, uh, I mean, convincing use cases. So we need to find the killer applications. So uh, in which cases an intelligent surface might create a big uh, difference uh, in signal quality. So uh, as you know, as far as I know from all standards, we need to increase at least five-fold, ten-fold improvement in order to have a technology to enter to the standards. So that's the reason why we need to find those 
killer applications. Again, practical Patmos channel modeling and real-time testing of large-scale intelligent surface in different environments, different operating frequencies. This is also a very open and promising uh, research direction uh, for the future. So again, we are communication engineers, so we need to determine the fundamental performance limits of RAS assisted networks. So in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of energy efficiency, spectral efficiency, optimization and resource allocation is a very interesting direction. So we need to find uh, optimal, uh, I mean, resource allocation in space, time and frequency domains. It's a very interesting direction. So as we discussed earlier, optimum placement of the RAS is very critical, very important. Optimization of the overall network is very important. So for instance, how many surfaces do you need to cover an indoor environment? How many surfaces do you need to cover uh, a, a campus? So these are open questions right now. So development of EM-based models and the, uh, I mean, the development of models considering hardware effects. For instance, what happens when, uh, let's say, two of the reflecting LMS fails in, in the middle? So uh, these are again open problems. Exploration of millimeter wave and terahertz communication systems. For instance, this is the plasmonic reflector array, uh, as well as I remember from Professor Akhil's paper uh, for terahertz communications. It's again an interesting direction and exploration of the potential of intelligent services for beyond communications. What are those sensing, radar, localization, etc.? So this is again appears as a very interesting direction. So as we discussed earlier, when we have multiple intelligent surfaces in the environment, maybe we can activate some of them. We can deactivate some of them. So th this is I mean very interesting uh, research problem, and more importantly, their coordination and optimization uh, becomes a task, becomes a challenging task. So maybe we can use artificial intelligent driving tools for this optimization, reconfiguration of services. And very interesting direction, again, exploration of futuristic scenarios for 6G. For instance, very high number of devices. As far as I know, in 6G, we can have a new service category, combination of enhanced mobile broadband and future reliable low latency communications, uh, very high mobility. Maybe we can explore the potential of intelligent services for these uh, very interesting uh, directions. So, uh, and more importantly, to conclude, standardization and integration to existing wireless communication networks such as 5G, 4G, 6G, IoT, uh, Wi-Fi. So we need joint effort of academia and industry, uh, particularly for standardization and integration to existing uh, communication networks. To sum up, I think, in my opinion, it's perfect time to do research on 6G. So that's the reason why uh, I, I, we have many researchers, we have many experts from 6G flagship today. Uh, started active research on 6G for some time ago. So we are also doing active research. I think it's the perfect time. Uh, we need to develop the technology of 2030 and beyond. So uh, intelligent reflecting service uh, technology appears to be a a very interesting, uh, I mean, a technology for the 6G wireless networks. We can use them to shape the radio waves in the environment, to control the environment, or as we discussed earlier, we can use it to realize low complexity and energy efficiency transmitters without a radio frequency change. This is the question that we are trying to find an answer. Uh, is it the secret remedy that we are looking for 6G? We will see, hopefully, in the upcoming uh, couple of years. Again, we need effective collaboration of academia and industry for new proposals, new studies, uh, for new patents for 6G and standardization activities for the standardization of this uh, technology. So uh, before ending this presentation, maybe I can end with a couple of announcements. Uh, right now, uh, we are forming a emerging technology initiative on smart radio environments, intelligent reflecting uh, surfaces. Uh, we have two, uh, I'm one of the chairs of this ETI also, the uh, we have also one chair from uh, industry. So uh, it is right now under review at Comsoc. Hopefully it will be available in the following weeks. So please follow this website. So we, we are planning to have some many activities, maybe some special issues, workshops, special issues, uh, discussions, forums, maybe a full day uh, tutorial. We will see, we will see in the upcoming times. So uh, we have right now an open special issue and I took the Open Journal of Communication Society. We are accepting uh, submissions until September 1st. Uh, so if you have high quality submissions, 
in the field of intelligent surfaces, so please feel free to uh, consider our special issue. We have another special issue coming up on IEEE Communications Magazine. So uh, unfortunately, we will have only maybe 10 papers maximum, I don't know. So uh, we don't want to hurt anyone, but it is on the way. Uh, hopefully it will be available very soon. Uh, maybe in uh, one or two weeks, we will see. So we will have another special issue here in uh, Communications Magazine. Uh, finally, we have a book, upcoming book from IET. Uh, Intelligent Reflecting Surfaces is one of the uh, chapters of it. I wrote it by myself. We have also some other chapters focusing on uh, waveform design, OFTM, index modulation, missing MIMO. Some uh, expert colleagues such as Professor Octavio Dobre, Professor Vincent Pordin Klontai, uh, from Chinese colleagues, Miao Wen Wen, and so on, they contributed. So it's coming up. Uh, hopefully, it will be a good reference for uh, a graduate level course or practicing engineers. So I would like to thank you. Hopefully, I used the time uh, efficiently, uh, not very efficiently, but uh, this was a very long topic. I, I would like to thank you for your patience and listening. So uh, I would be very pleased to answer uh, your questions, uh, if any. Uh, you can also send an email to me later on. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this presentation uh, will be available online uh, after some time. Thank you for your attendance. All right, thank you, Ertugar. Um, uh, yeah, ex excellent presentation going through various topics from channel modeling to you know theoretical basis and also implementations, open uh, research problems, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, we have time for some, some questions earlier. Um, Emil asked me whether, yeah, there is time. If, if is Emil here? Very, very pleased with him. So t thank you, Emil. Um, yeah. I can, oh, hello. I cannot see the participants. Thank, thank you okay. for I'm honored. Thank you. Uh, but uh, you can see my picture now, I guess. Which picture? I, I took several pictures. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, like 10, 15 years ago, when I was a PhD student, uh, this kind of cooperative communication was like a, mm -hmm. the, the popular topic. And, and me then too, me were, too. <laughs> and, and then people were using this type of argument. Look, Current technology optimized the, the transmitter and mm -hmm. receiver, and now we're going to add this uh, cooperative communication functionality, mm -hmm. which was relays, and then we were able to to do new things. And there were optimization on relay positioning, relay selection, all these type of things that are sort of resembling many of the the problems that you were discussing, but now with reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. Uh, so, in a way. Who has ever seen a relay? I, I guess they, they are deployed in, in network some places. They are deployed in 4G. They are deployed in 4G. Yeah. But, 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 it's, but it's not like something that has made it into our homes. And so, so uh, it, 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 do you agree that relays are technology that didn't uh, really succeed? And definitely, it, it, definitely, definitely. Even because I also worked on cooperative communications for several years during my Master of Science, maybe beginning of PhD. Uh, both were very popular almost 10 years ago. So I definitely agree with you. We also discussed this uh, uh, with you maybe some time ago. I definitely think that there will be a renewed interest on relaying, definitely, because uh, I agree with you that the functionalities are very similar, uh, but also agree with you that I think relaying uh, has a huge potential and still not well understood and not well explored, in my opinion, because... By the way, I mean, if, if you don't uh, mind opinion. me, yeah. Uh, could you think that it could be a combination of these things that might be eventually applied? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yes, it's a, I guess one of the difference between us is that I would like to describe RS as one new category of relays, while uh, it was clear now in the talk that... Uh, Professor Bassar is not uh, describing it in the entirely same way, but, but I think it really my question is that uh, why will do you think that reconfigurable intelligent surfaces will succeed when relays didn't really? Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, uh, maybe uh, we need to take a look from many different perspectives, like cost, uh, efficiency, performance. I also follow your works very closely. I know that relays are very successful when they deployed, I mean, uh, I mean, very carefully. So uh, in my opinion, uh, I mean, uh, I also find the comparison of intelligent surface and relay a little bit unfair, but uh, maybe the cost, maybe uh, the 
main factor. So if we can manufacture an intelligent surface, maybe let's say, uh, I mean, much cheaper than a relay, maybe in that case, we can have those intelligent surfaces uh, as a big supporter of the network. But I'm never saying this. For instance, this, is, this was also uh, something we discussed over LinkedIn uh, some time ago. So in order to cover the Times Square, I would pick Massive MIMO, definitely, because you cannot cover it with the surface. No way, no way, no way, because I also know the physical channel modeling right now. I can say this, but we can use intelligent surfaces to support the network. So uh, like relays, relays might be also supportive of the network. Intelligent reflecting surface might also support the network. Or maybe in some specific cases, we can use it as a transmitter to, to maybe simplify the uh, transmitter architecture. So we will see Southeast University has some very promising prototypes in that direction. So it can be used as a transmitter maybe, it's a different story, uh, but definitely, it can be uh, used as a, I mean, supportive to the existing infrastructure, in my opinion. So this is also one of the open directions in one of the slides. Uh, I would definitely pick Massive MIMO, support the network with intelligent services, <laughs> is my opinion. So I hope you agree. I had one second question, which you were touching upon as well. You were also observing that you would like to put the intelligent surface close to the transmitter or mm -hmm. the receiver. Mm -hmm. and if you put them very close to each other, then you're sort of coming to the case what people are calling RF lenses or holographic mm, definitely, type definitely. of things. Uh, definitely. Is that sort of the conclusion that maybe it is not the reconfigurable intelligent surface that is placed somewhere else that we would like to have, but it is the RF lens, it is the holographic MIMO uh, things that uh, is the real good embodiment of the technology. Uh, I see, I see, I see your point definitely, I agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, the, the scattering uh, tells us that we need to close it, uh, put it close to the transmitter or receiver. Otherwise, if you put it in the middle, uh, there's a huge path loss. Uh, and okay, if the line of sight is blocked, again, it can save the day, but if there is a strong line of sight, uh, then you cannot even notice the difference in the receive signal power by RS. That's the reason why we are trying to put it uh, to the close, but you are right. Uh, maybe it could be in the near field, it's a different story. Uh, if it is in the far field boundary, it's a different story. Uh, but this is what, uh, I mean, scattering uh, tells us. This is what, I mean, physical channel modeling tells us. We need to position it uh, closely to the transmitter or receiver. Uh, I also showed the scatter MIMO prototype of uh, University of San Diego guys. They also put it, as far as I remember, 20 or 30 meters close to the access point. This is in their prototype. Uh, and the receiver is maybe 20 or 30 meters away. So they say that if I put intelligent surface here, in that case, I can have the same power with the line of sight. So that's the reason why they are putting it there. Uh, but I agree with you. Yes, the, 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 this is what physics says. You need to put it uh, close to the uh, uh, transmitter. Maybe I think that point, you were saying holographic MIMO. So I'm not a full expert like you in that area, but yes, there are conceptual similarities as well, I have to admit. Yeah, I think the holographic MIMO that Pivotal Comware are building is essentially a sort of meta surface with the transmitter uh, behind. So it's the same concept except it use diffraction instead of reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. Anyway, I, I agree with you. So thank you for a nice presentation. <laughs> th thank, you. <laughs> th th thank you for your constructive comments. Uh, thank you. I'm very pleased that you joined. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Joel, right. hi. This is Erdal, how are you? Uh, Professor Erdal, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Professor. Well, uh, actually, I'm not in this field here, but I'm just wondering uh, the following practical problem when you are trying to use the system here. Mm -hmm. Now, as you described that, you know, this uh, intelligent surface has lots of uh, small uh, mm -hmm. cells, and each cell you have to adjust uh, uh, phases, and then yes. this, uh, this variation, the, the, the Variation of the phase changes in time, right? So every time of course, you have of to course. adjust the phases. Of course. So as a as a, a expert in the uh, synchronization guy, you know, I'm asking. It's very difficult to phase synchronization at uh, at the receiver side, actually. So I'm wondering, is there any really potential application that really implemented the system online, and then they are trying to estimate the phases and everything, mm -hmm. then they receive the mm -hmm. data. What is the situation? 
Uh, uh, Professor Erdal, thank you so much for this very important question. Actually, I received this question in all my presentations. So how we can have those chain uh, phase knowledge at the RIS? How we can synchronize it uh, very quickly? This is a very right. good question. Biggest problem, uh, Professor, in this implementation. So uh, first of all, intelligence surface is a passive device. Therefore, it cannot estimate the channel by itself. So you can send pilots from here, it hits the surface, then you receive the pilots at the receiver, then you can do channel estimation at the receiver. You might have end-to-end -end channel, not individual channels. You can feedback, uh, not end-to-end -end channel, but you, there should be some kind of a control link between the intelligent surface and access point or receiver. We need that control channel, definitely, because intelligent surface cannot adjust phases uh, in a I mean, standalone mode, so it needs some kind of an intelligent surface or uh, intelligent uh, control, or we need to put it some artificial intelligence uh, to intelligent surface, then intelligent surface might sense the environment, might yeah. sense the transmitter and receiver, then it can adjust the phases. There are also some uh, studies uh, in that direction. Oh, Queen is also here thinking, thank you for joining. So in my uh, opinion, Yes, yeah, King King also a has a question, I think. Yeah, 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 thank yeah, you, yeah. 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 Thank you, thank you, Professor Erdal. King yeah, King. Thank you, Professor, for, for the very impressive talk. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you I so much. You, you summarize a lot of applications and many research topics in this area. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, I, I want uh, just now uh, you and Emil talk about the the comparison about the relay and uh, mm -hmm. reconfigure the IRS, right? Because mm -hmm. I think there, there is one possible uh, a reason that the relay was not that successful is uh, probably can be replaced. Uh, its performance can be achieved by the recently, by the like uh, deploying more base stations, right? Mm -hmm. Out, like an ultra dense network with a comparable uh, cost and complexity. And uh, if we deploy the relay and uh, compare it to if we deploy more base stations, it has uh, no additional, it has not that much additional performance gain as well as the complexity and the cost of reduction. But mm -hmm. uh, right now, in terms of the uh, intelligent reflecting surface or IIS, I think uh, there could be a lot of uh, uh, benefits in terms of the complexity performance mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, hardware, yeah, I think. Uh, th thank you for the comment, uh, King King. In my opinion, yes, it is similar to AF relay. So when I first, this topic, there was a colleague of mine working on relaying some time. I, I uh, went to him and said that we are returning back to AF relay because th yes, the model is simple, uh, but I agree with you. So uh, actually this comparison, Maybe we can ask this, whether it's totally fair to compare an intelligent reflecting surface with relay, because they have different functionalities. But uh, I agree with you, if we carefully position the intelligent surface, uh, we, we might have a huge degree of freedom as far as I understand. So uh, it, it might have a potential. But yes, it cannot fully replace the relay, not in all cases. So because as we discussed earlier, so if we put this intelligent surface in between, uh, instead of putting a relay in between putting intelligent reflecting surface, I don't recommend it. If you want to put something in between the transmitter and receiver, just in the middle, use pick the relay. So because in that case, relay might have a more, I mean, a positive effect. This is also shown in Emil's recent papers, as far as I remember. But uh, I mean, I mean uh, if you can have the intelligent reflecting surface closer to the transmitter and receiver, if you adjust the size correctly, so maybe in that case. Uh, you can have a remarkable improvements as far as right. I um, okay thank you there is another person who raised and could yes. you go ahead yes uh, i just have a question i want to ask uh, somebody also raised that kind of issue about the channel channel estimation because the mm -hmm. race is a passive this is element. A big problem this yeah, is a big so, problem yeah and exactly in millimeter wave that you have to do this kind of beam sweeping in the initial access mm -hmm. then how do you keep mm -hmm. changing the the weights on the surfaces so that you can be able to do that kind of initial access or is it going to be that you have to turn off the relay or the surface during the initial uh, access where you want to do this beam sweeping to get uh, the actually, channels and then you do it for the actually it's a very interesting question it's a very interesting 
question. Uh, there are a number of channel estimation protocols available in the literature. So as far as I know, uh, I mean, they are not fully looking from those practical perspective, but as far as I know, uh, in the frame structure, I think King King, you also did a work on OFTM as far as I remember. In the frame structure, there's a training uh, part at the beginning of the frame. In the training part, a base station sends pilots towards the intelligence service. So, it might go to the intelligence surface because uh, those pilots must be reflected by the intelligent reflecting surface to the receiver. In that way, you might have an idea of the end of end 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 to end channel between the transmitter and receiver. So there are some different tricks in the literature, as far as I remember. Uh, for instance, certain elements of the intelligence surface are on and off. They are adjusted into specific uh, phase values. There are some different ideas, but as far as I remember, in this Scatter MIMO work, let me find that they have a very clever, uh, I mean, uh, channel estimation protocol as well. I, I couldn't remember the numbers now, but as far as I remember, they estimate the channels in five gigahertz. It's not millimeter wave, okay? it's, it's sub six gigahertz. They estimate the channels by just sending a couple of pilot uh, symbols, as far as I remember. So they can do it in sub 60 words. But in millimeter wave, yes, it, it, it might be maybe more difficult. Uh, maybe Emil and King King may also comment at this point. So, uh, so maybe Professor uh, Ardal may also comment it. Yes, channel estimation might be maybe even more difficult at millimeter waves. But these guys showed that at five gigahertz, it is possible. Uh, just in uh, in a couple of uh, microseconds, as far as I remember, I couldn't exactly remember the numbers, uh, but they they do it. They do it. They show that it is possible. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, it is possible. But in millimeter wave, yes, uh, those with I mean beam CV wing, there would be uh, more difficulties, uh, in my opinion. All right. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the channel estimation, there has been two main approaches. The, as uh, you may see in my in our tutorial paper on the archive, the first one is that we do not uh, change the passive nature of the surface, mm -hmm. and but we do the channel estimation at the base station mm -hmm. by letting the users send in the pilots, and then we make use uh, full use of the patent uh, of the IR, so IRs provided, and then mm -hmm. let the base station to estimate the, uh, the channel and. Uh, that, that is we call it cas cascaded channel or contaminated channel and by using these kind of channels we can also do the optimization as well as some analysis of the of the um, sister, uh, sister system and uh, in turn uh, besides uh, this uh, approach there has been another um, um, another additional approach is that we actively deploy some sensors uh, or sensors, sensors. Yeah, sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, sensors that can be deployed on the surface uh, because we have these kind of active sensors, so we can uh, use it to assist our channel estimation, especially mm -hmm. for the IRs involved channel estimation channel links. And also recently, we also developed and proposed some new approaches uh, besides these two approaches. For example, we can use some anchors. And here, anchors, I mean that we can deploy some dedicated nodes in front of the surface. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, because uh, for each surface, we know that we have a controller, right? We have mm -hmm. a, at least we have a controller to, to synchronize, to communicate and feedback. This kind of a controller can also be used as some dedicated anchors. And we can make use of the channels from the anchor to the IRs and to help mm -hmm. to estimate the Mm -hmm. channels of all the links to reduce the traditional channel, ca mm -hmm. channel estimation complexity. And this is a, a one of a uh, new approach recently mm -hmm. we proposed. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, thank you, King King. Emil, please go ahead. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I think that in general, you can for sure estimate the channel. The question is how long time it takes and to what accuracy, mm -hmm. so what kind of mobility you can support. Then uh, I am a little bit concerned in general to put in more equipment uh, like uh, the sensors or anchors or things like that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's theoretically a good idea, but as soon as you put in something with an, an R chain, you're sort of back at the, the relay in comparison. Okay, uh, what are we actually putting in there? What kind of hardware? I mean, the simplest type of relay is a repeater. No RF chains, no nothing, only an amplifier, everything analog, very simple. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a risk that in order to overcome this type of estimation problem, we will have to add so much hardware into it that it's not worth it anymore. So, so I think that this is really a very important problem. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we can overcome it. De definitely, definitely. Thank you, King King and Emil, for this uh, interesting comments. I definitely agree with you. There are a couple of designs in which there are some active sensors embedded. Maybe King King mentioned that. I also saw it later on. Uh, the, the authors are using compressed sensing type algorithms and deep learning. Uh, there are also some reference points in the room. For instance, you estimate the channels for those reference points and apply it into a deep learning network to obtain the channels uh, at a given point. So th there are many different approaches to channel estimation problem. Uh, so it is not easy, but manageable as far as I see. Manageable. So we find optimal solutions definitely in order to fully benefit intelligent analysis. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we are running out of time. Uh, there's still one more hand raised, so please go ahead. Hello? Hello? Uh, I see one hand raised, so I don't know. Sorry, can you hear me? I have one question. Go ahead. Please. Sir? Thank you. I have one question. As you said that in order the IRS to be effective, the number of passive arrays should be large enough. For mm -hmm. example, how many passive arrays should be implemented? For 1,000, 10,000? Uh, it's a good, good question. Uh, it's a good question. For instance, in, the, in this prototype, there are 48 uh, those passive patch elements. So in our prototype, there are 12, for instance. For instance, in the prototype of these uh, Southeast University guys, there are, uh, let me find it, uh, I mean, thousands, uh, there are thousands of, uh, I mean, those passive elements. So, I mean, it is a optimization problem. It's again an open problem. Uh, as we discussed earlier, when you have a larger surface, it is better. Uh, because you can collect more power, you can steer more power, it's better uh, for your receive signal quality. But in return, your cost increases, your control circuit uh, gets more complicated. Uh, for instance, in our prototype, a single Arduino is enough. But if we double the size of the surface, I need two Arduinos. So the complexity increases, controlling increases, a channel estimation overhead increases. So I, I need to find a compromise again, So, uh, in my opinion. So uh, in theory, you can increase it. Uh, as you see in this large RAS, this is large RAS2. This is the small RAS with 8 times 32 unit cells. So it is, again, an optimization problem. Maybe for a given environment, this might be enough. But for a certain environment, for instance, you need to use it in Times Square, this is not enough anymore. You might need to use a larger one. So this is, again, an optimization problem. Uh, the number of reflecting elements and the size of the uh, intelligent source. But it's a very interesting question. Uh, we have cost, estimation, complexity, training, overhead, many factors to consider. So that's the reason why I cannot say that let us increase the number of reflecting elements as much as I, I can. So I cannot do it. But there is always some practical concern. So if we, if we consider that an IRS with 128 by 128 passive arrays, and we just mm -hmm. consider that the size of each passive array is one centimeter square, the total size of a square would be something about 1.28 square meter. So is actually, that much way to be implemented? It's, it's a function of wavelength, actually. Uh, as far as I know, in, in our prototype, we, we select as wavelength over two, uh, for instance, the difference between uh, these elements, also the size of it, uh, it is also around wavelength over two. It's a function of the frequency. Uh, therefore, uh, if you go to higher frequencies, you might have uh, a more number of reflecting elements in a given uh, surface area that I can see. So we were studying this in, in a recent paper about the near field and the far field. And mm -hmm. I think the general rule of thumb is that, I mean, as you're saying, you need more elements to fill out an, an area, but the area that you need is essentially frequency independent. Mm -hmm. And I would say that if you would like it to, to work like a specular mirror or better, you need to be at the distance, which is, if it's one by one meter, maybe you mm -hmm. could be up to a few meters mm -hmm. uh, from it. And I think a good way of, of thinking about it is also think about the mirror that you look yourself into. Is it large enough to, that you can see yourself mm -hmm. in it? Well, then you're Definitely. close enough to use it as an RS. And if you're Definitely. too far away, Definitely. then it's going to be too small.
Definitely, definitely. And also the size also determines the near field, far field. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Emil, for this nice uh, I mean, comment. So yes, there are many factors that you need to consider when determining the size of your uh, surface as well. Okay, great. Uh, so I think we have gone through a uh, sufficient number of questions. So I thank you. Very much, uh, and then uh, hopefully once this uh, recording is available, I'll I'll share it. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, uh, and thank uh, you, Doctor Nandana, for your kind host. So I'm very pleased uh, with this nice interaction as well, also for your kind host. So thank you so much. Thank right. you, Arturo. It was nice to listen to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a nice Thank day. you, Nandana. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Really. Yeah.